Okay, welcome to the seminars, to the Severo Ochoa seminars from the Instituto de Astrofísica Andalucía. We are just now connected also to the Spanish Astronomical Society colleagues and also from other institutions that are sharing with us this seminar. We have the one of the programs that we have in our Severo Ochoa uh, Award is as uh, an invitation program to have seminars here in the Institute. And we have the pleasure today to have with us uh, Professor Avery Broderick, he's coming from US and from, he will talk about black holes. And in fact, in order to do a proper introduction of uh, Professor Broderick, I give uh, the floor to Professor Luis Thank you very much, Anisha. Okay, we were just laughing a few minutes ago, talking about, you know, the arbor tree of, you know, who was your advisor and, and, and how, how the, when you trace it back and, Everything he did with his PhD with Roger Blanford, who actually he was a PhD student of Martin Rees, and probably you start, you know, like digging up and then you go all the way to Newton. So, uh, so we are really, really, it is really a pleasure to have uh, uh, every here. So, every did, as I said, uh, his PhD with Roger Blanford in, in Caltech, and then they, uh, he did a postdoc in, the, in, uh, in Harvard, and after that, uh, he did a second postdoc uh, at the uh, Canadian uh, Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, and uh, and he held a position, a uh, joint position at Waterloo University and Perimeter Institute uh, since uh, 20, uh, 2011. So every has been working basically on everything. I remember the first time I met you, it was a meeting in Italy, and it was a meeting about uh, parallel rotation analysis of, of blazers. And I remember that I, I had a terrible flight. I arrived at 2 a.m., and then I go to the hotel and I saw a young fellow uh, who arrived at the same time as me very late in, and I didn't know you. And then throughout the meeting, I got to know every as one of the smartest person I ever met in my life. And I've been working with him since I don't know how many years now, every, but for at least 15 years, probably or even more. And he and he keeps surprising me. He, he I think, and I mentioned this. I think to uh, many of you that uh, for me, Avery is one of the smartest person I ever met. I mean, he knows everything about everything. <laughs> Truly. I mean, this is something that is amazing. He he has been working on Nitrous, uh, he has been working on star formation, he has been working on, on Blazer, he has been he has written seminar papers about parallel rotation blazers and uh, and, and you name it. And then he he decided that uh, you know he wanted to study black holes, and then he started analyzing the players in J. he started uh, actually working with uh, with Roger Blanford on getting some predictions about polarization in black holes. And then he he, did, he was uh, one of the founding fathers uh, of the EHT. And he uh, he helped develop the, the EHT and uh, and he has had his uh, huge influence in the in the EHT since then. And uh, one of the best uh, examples of that uh, is the, his, his students. I mean, his student has been uh, the, the people that have been leading also the, the EHT research over this year. So, so uh, uh, every contribution, you know, is, is always there. It, he has been a, almost, you know, a key contributor in any of the major paper from the EHT. And, uh, and in fact, he was, uh, as you know, uh, uh, he was uh, one of the presenters in, in Washington uh, uh, of the first images of a black hole uh, the, with the results of from M7. And uh, as I said, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to have him uh, working together with us uh, because if I have any doubt, I know that he will, he will resolve it. And, and he was really instrumental for Saige. We were discussing this morning, you know, how good are our dynamical reconstruction of Saige? And we're saying, ah, oh, some people say they are really bad, they are really good. You don't know how bad it was at the beginning. We were totally lost. We had no idea what Sajay was doing. We were absolutely lost for months. And then every year start analyzing the, the, the noise in the data, the variability in the data. And it was thanks to him that he decided that we could try to get, get an average image of Sajay by you know inflating our error bars to account for the variability so we were not going for a movie but we were going for a, a static image and it was then after his pioneering work that we actually started getting the first images of a side game so uh, i think uh, the name of uh, of every will be always attached to the first uh, black hole images 
not only in MIT-7, but in SciGate. And he is, has been also pioneering the work about the detecting the photon ring, which is the one that actually imprints all the uh, uh, all the metric, uh, space time metric in our images. This is the, this is the, the holy grail for, for the EHT. And he is, again, leading this work. And today he is going to talk about how we can dismythify the ring in the in, in black hole. So thanks a lot. It is really a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us today. Well, thank you, uh, Jose. I want to meet this person you described, the last I'm uh, really me. Um, but uh, I'm always uh, impressed and thankful for your boundless optimism and your uh, sage advice and uh, uh, wisdom, especially with uh, EHD data sets were extraordinary in their uh, information content and in their difficulty. All right. Uh, I also want to thank Anshan uh, uh, for the, you know, inviting me to this uh, wonderful institute. I was in Granada a few years ago. That was a, a wonderful uh, experience. There are you know, a few places, I get to go to a lot of amazing cities and see the insides of hotels. And the last time I was in Granada, I got to see the Alhambra. We got to eat on the rooftop bars. It was amazing. It was one of the few trips where I couldn't believe, I couldn't convince my wife to come with me. I was extremely happy to come back. But what I missed in the first trip was visiting the Institute of Astrophysica de Andalusia. And I'm really excited that I've been able to visit, uh, visit you all today. All right, so um, without further, further ado, I wanted to say something uh, about what these photon rings are that people talk about, what science we might be able to get out of them, why they are an interesting thing, uh, and then importantly, how we might go about detecting them. And uh, I hope to inspire some people. I'm going to be a little ambitious at the end, uh, maybe, maybe moving a little bit into fiction. I'll let you decide. But I firmly believe that uh, you know, there is a future of photon ring observations to be had. The only question is whether or not it occurs in my career or the career of, of students in the audience today. Uh, and I'm going to try to inspire you to participate in making that happen. All right, so our, our story really begins uh, 105 years ago um, with uh, Sir Arthur Eddington launching his expedition to the corners of the Earth in uh, search of the uh, uh, best place to view the eclipse. Now, this is interesting for me right now because uh, almost 105 years to the day later, we're gonna have a full sol a total solar eclipse uh, that we'll be able to view uh, from Niagara Falls. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but uh, uh, this search for gravitational lensing, of course, was one of the key predictions made by general relativity, the subtle shift in the locations of stars, uh, due to the gravity of the sun, viewable only when the sun is blotted out, uh, became one of the uh, key triumphs that put Einstein and general relativity on the map. A hundred years later, the astronomers did it again. We went to the uh, highest and driest corners of the world and Granada. Uh, so this is high, but uh, it's awfully close to a wonderful place to be. Uh, and uh, try to find evidence uh, for, for general relativity again. And the answer, of course, I think everybody has seen. I've seen actually pictures of this throughout the Institute, uh, which, is, which is wonderful to see. First image of a black hole in which you could see the event horizon silhouetted against the emission as a dark shadow in the interior. Of course, we've not been idle since then. Uh, we published the first picture polarization map of M87 with these large correlated polarization structures saying something about the magnetic fields. Uh, the first constraints on circular polarization in M87. Uh, it's another situation where we had trouble coming up with a unique image, uh, but, but we report that too. And just last month, the first, uh, the second image of M87 from the following year, from 2018. And uh, we were all three to sigh of relief when we saw the shadow again. Okay, of course, there's also another black hole in our target list. The black hole at the center of the galaxy, the Sagittarius star that uh, uh, Jose mentioned a, a moment ago. Here's our picture of that published a few years ago. Um, and we do things beyond horizon scale science. There's a number of uh, active galactic nuclei that we observe regularly. I'm not going to say much about them other than to say that we are, you know, sometimes respectable radio astronomers engaging in uh, what's pejoratively called globology <laughs> as well, but at the highest resolution uh, uh, ever. So on resolution, uh, sometimes I like to try to describe to popular audiences, I know this is a 
is a is a thoughtful and, and educated scientific audience, but uh, uh, public audiences, you know, what what kind of resolution EHT really produces? And I'll use things like reading dimes on the other side of the planet, or since I come from Canada now, uh, hockey pucks on the moon. You can replace that with your favorite sports ball. Mm -hmm. um, but recently, uh, I came across an example that I think is better than all of those, uh, and that's uh, IBM. If you had eyes that could see with EHD resolution, you could look at the tip of your outstretched finger and see the atoms. Okay, from where you see now, if I held this up on the substrate, you'd read IBM. That's EHD resolution. It's the highest imaging instrument in the history of humanity, which explains why we get a little perturbed when people ask, why is it so fuzzy? <laughs> The other reason why we get upset by that is because uh, we grew up on pictures that weren't. And I think everybody in the EHT still wants to see this. All right, so that's that's really going to be the topic for the rest of the presentation. How are we going to get from a fuzzy fire donut to something with a lot of clear substructure? Okay, so let me lay out some of the uh, science landscape for the EHT. Uh, what science questions we might be able to answer if we had something like that. Um, and really, I think EHG science uh, comes in <laughs> two and a half tranches, two main tranches, one, one small tranche. The first would be, you know, astrophysics, or because it's all about growing black holes, or the gastronomy of black holes, gastrophysics. And, uh, you know, questions there are things like, how do the black holes grow? Something that's receiving a lot of attention in the era of JWST now. Uh, how are those jets that we see from uh, a number of AGN launched, how they reach relativistic speeds? And you can take those two large-scale questions and subdivide them into things like how is angular momentum and tra energy transported through accretion flows? Uh, what's the importance of the magnetic field geometry? What is it? Et cetera. Uh, the second tranche would be gravity. Is, is Einstein right? That's basically it. And again, we can subdivide that into questions like do horizons exist, do ergospheres exist? Maybe, uh, you know, most importantly, is the Kerr solution, the solution that we think describes every astrophysical black hole, is that a good description of the dynamics of test particles around Sagittarius star and M87? And at what level could we entertain alternatives? And then, of course, there's other science that doesn't involve astrophysics or gravity, things like some exotic particle physics, exotic jet disk relationships. Maybe there's binaries or maybe uh, the, the stellar environment of black holes. I'm very proud to say that my group regularly tries to come up with crazy things to do, but we're not the only one. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, ancillary science that we do. But just a few words on how we address some of these in practice, uh, starting with the gastrophysics. An example of a kind of question that I think we already have some traction on, and it's been a topic of our meeting uh, here at the Institute, uh, is you know, how important is uh, MHD torque, or how important is turbulence in producing the torques that drive accretion onto black holes? That is to say, uh, which of these two movies does uh, something like Sagi Star look like? Is it a nice stationary uh, uh, image, a nice stationary uh, object with uh, uh, without all of the turbulent uh, features in which we have a great mystery of how it's uh, moving uh, angular momentum around, or is it something that has all of these sweeping random stochastic uh, structures, substructures in it, which matches the kind of picture that goes all the way back to Shakura Sonyev and their alpha disk model when they noted that you need viscosity and it's not molecular, it has to be something else, and magnetic fields are always invoked, right? So this is this is that kind of picture. And finally, we're at a point where we can test this. And the way you might do that, the way we did do that, uh, is to look at a large number of GRMHD simulations. This is work done by former student of mine, Boris Georgiev, to look at a large number of GRMHD simulations, these uh, most sophisticated numerical simulations of the near black hole environment, the gas the magnetized plasma surrounding the black hole, um, in which you do get that turbulence. And in fact, these are both movies from this is a movie from a GRMHD simulation. This is the average of a movie from a GRMHD simulation. Uh, and after doing a little pre-processing to try to eliminate and suppress large-scale fluctuations, 
beyond some scale, beyond some, uh, uh, some, some spatial frequency, so large scales are off here on the left, small scales are off here on the right, the turbulent power spectrum turns over and goes like a power law. And that's a very specific power law that's informative of what's going on with the turbulent substructures in the accretion flows in those simulations. We also developed the capacity to make estimates for that turbulent power spectrum from the data. That's these black dots. Uh, and the range of these simulations is shown here by this red band. And some of those are spot on. Now, I'm not going to say that variability in Sagittarius Star is completely solved. There are questions about variability in the GRMHD simulations. But the question of what is the shape of the power spectrum, well, that looks like it's a pretty good success. So that all those times I told young students that, oh, the viscosity is all MHD turbulence. Well, finally, I have an empirical footing to make that claim. Of. A second gastrophysical example. Uh, would be uh, how do jets launch? So John Hawley uh, told a joke a while back that said jet launching mechanisms need three ingredients. Uh, the first is a source of angular momentum. The second are large scale ordered magnetic fields. And the third is Roger Blanford. And since, as you heard, Roger was my former advisor, that spoke very, very clearly to me uh, and is true. Uh, so the second one, though, is our topic here, large scale ordered magnetic fields because uh, the synchrotron emission that EHT sees is polarized relative to the orientation of the magnetic field. If the magnetic fields are ordered, we ought to see ordered, magnetic, uh, uh, ordered polarization structures on the horizon scales at the footprint of the jet. Right? So that's a strong prediction. And here's maybe a, a slightly more quantitative version of the polarization maps of M87. Here's a simulation on the left. Here's the actual data on April 11 on the right. And indeed, we see this ordered magnetic field structures that are, are otherwise uh, expected or anticipated uh, in, the, uh, in the presence of a, a jet launching region that has order magnetic field in Roger Blanford. So again, another gastrophysical question that I think has an important qualitative answer due to EHT. But looking towards gravity, um, that gravitational sector. The real challenge is to exclude astrophysical answers or astrophysical uncertainty. There's wild uncertainties in exactly what the structure of the accretion flow is, exactly how the jet is launched, what other components we might have. Um, and you don't want your gravity tests, which are often quite precise, to be uh, infected or, or corrupted by this large astrophysical systematic uh, so how, how does one go about that? We've known how to do this for a very long time. So here's something that's almost 20 years old now, which makes me feel very old. Um, but it's going to be a, a, a movie that zooms in dramatically um, of a hotspot orbiting around. Here it is in coordinate space. So you can kind of see what we're looking at. And the first thing you see is there's a, there's a primary, there's a big blob, but then there's a secondary image. Right? Those are the photons that have gone around the back of the black hole. There's even a tertiary image. Those are the ones that have gone all the way around the black hole before coming to us. I think there might even be a fourth order image in here, but it's just very hard to see. The tertiary is hard enough. You can also see some light curves. So you can see that these are not subtle effects. Um, and, and despite the fact that the dynamics of the spot does affect exactly where that secondary shows up, uh, clearly gravity is running the show in relating the secondary to the primary to the tertiary, okay? In other words, the goal here is not to use the spot as a dynamical particle to measure something, but to use the photons that take the multiple paths to us. This is not really a new idea. I mean, that's what Eddington was about. Uh, but of course, people do this with dark matter all the time. They try to reconstruct lensing potentials and from that mass maps. It's the same sort of idea. Use lensing to remove uh, the, the astrophysical uncertainties. If I were to take that orbiting hotspot model and I were to look down the pole, look down the polar axis, that's, that's really what's appropriate for M87. Uh, we are looking maybe 20 degrees away from the polar axis, which is still pretty close to straight down. And I were to smear the emission out, I were to make it into an annulus just as a toy model and look at it, those uh, secondary and tertiary uh, images would produce their own sets of rings. So our primary ring is a ring because our emission region is ring-like, our secondary and tertiaries uh, are rings 
because of the symmetry of the lensing. That's what we call photon rings. So old things become new again. They're really just higher order images. Uh, they get new branding with new instruments and new geometry. One thing that's uh, interesting is depending on where you put the emission, uh, these rings appear in slightly different places, but how different depends upon which order emission. Okay, so if we look at the primary, the emission that comes directly to us, it's extremely sensitive to where we decided to put the emission. That makes sense. And in fact, it almost only understands or only knows about the astrophysics. Where did you put the emission? But if you look at the tertiary, that third order image, that's this very thin line, it's almost unchanged between the two locations that are shown in this, in this very simple idealized simulation. And in fact, it cares only about, in this case, the black hole spin um, and therefore uh, uh, the gravity, the space-time geometry. It's almost completely insensitive to where you put the, the actual emission region. And the secondary is a mix of the two. It's the middle child. It can't decide which way to go. As we go up in higher uh, image order, we get more and more distilled information about gravity. So this is really why these photon rings, these higher order images have become so interesting because they are gravity distilled. Uh, an example of that, you know, we can look at two ways that we learn about the space time or could learn about the space time from these photon rings. Uh, the first is just by measuring a secondary at all, or if we were very fortunate, a tertiary. So first order photon ring, second order photon ring at all. You know, I said before that where the direct emission ring is depends on where you are. Uh, some people wrote a paper, uh, Sam Brawla, Dan Boltz, and, and Bob Wall wrote a paper saying, well, EHT doesn't really know what they're seeing because the emission region could be very far away without offering a reason why that's the case. Uh, now, at this conference, I heard from Machek, it's space aliens. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, that's true. You know, there could be some astrophysical reason that we don't understand. Maybe there's a lot of magnetic flux tubes that somehow maintain stability. Maybe there's a fifth force we don't know about. I don't know. Maybe the emission could be further away for some reason. And in that case, the size of the shadow becomes indicative of what we did to the emission region, not the black hole. But the second we see a secondary image, all of that systematic, systematic uncertainty, even, even putting that emission region off to infinity, uh, falls down to 36%. And if you, if you have a reasonable guess for where the emission is, you ignore the space aliens, then uh, you can do much better, of course. But immediately we bound our astrophysical uncertainty, or our astrophysics uncertainty. Uh, a tertiary, you do much better. And so even just detecting uh, and measuring the diameter of a single photon ring uh, has a massive impact. Uh, the second space-time parameter that people often talk about would be something like spin. And, and here's two images. Uh, Takahashi was doing this uh, a long time ago, but, but here's two images that show um, uh, uh, the, the shadow of a black hole that's not spinning and the shadow of a black hole that's spinning maximally. And from this, this uh, kind of work, a lot of people started to think about uh, how we can make shadow shape measurements. Um, this looks pretty difficult given the kinds of EHT observations I've seen, uh, but worse than that, these are both edge on. So the black hole spin is in the screen and that's not M87. M87, we're looking down the pole and by symmetry, both of these are gonna look like circles. And so for M87, we might be faced with an expectation and a measurement, is this smaller because it had larger spin or is it smaller because it had smaller mass? And, and right, you know, right now we're kind of, kind of stuck on that. Okay, so we don't get to use shadow state measurements along the pole. But however, once again, lensing comes to the rescue for us because uh, the, the way in which the secondary and the tertiary are related to the primary image depends upon spin in a nonlinear way. And so you can break the degeneracy between an overall scale factor that makes the whole thing bigger uh, in spin, which changes the relative locations of those rings. Uh, and even if you just had that N equals one photon ring, that secondary image, uh, and you took data at times when the emission region was in slightly different locations, you could make an honest to God spin measurement just from the paths of those photons alone. Okay, so it's again, a lensing measurement 
not the dynamics of the matter. Okay, so clearly lensing, as I said, we had every reason to expect, uh, is strongly sensitive to the geometry of space. Um, but everything I've described has gone in this direction. We posit a space-time geometry, and we infer an image, and then we go see what this image looks like and try to develop some estimate of the parameters of that geometry. But we'd really like to do something more like what people do when they look at weak lensing maps and, and reconstruct dark matter distributions, where we start with a, an image and just recast the measurements of the image in terms of a statement about the underlying space-time geometry. And it turns out that you can do that. So, so the way that that has been done in solar system environments or in weakly gravitating environments is you make some sort of expansion of your metric coefficients. And I, I know this is a spherical symmetric metric. We're gonna start with spherical symmetry just to build some intuition. You expand this out and replace 2m over r with 2 phi. And, and the, the goal is to see if phi is really m over r. And so you expand it in say powers of m over r. And that's a good expansion in the solar system because m over r is really tiny. So it's an expansion in a tiny number. Each successive term is getting smaller. But if you look at a black hole uh, near the horizon, every one of these terms becomes the same order. And then you're in trouble because you can have high order terms canceling or accommodating lower order terms. And you never really know if you've measured a deviation or not. And in fact, you can set up situations where there's a large deviation but it doesn't change the shape and the size of the shadow at all. So we need something non-perturbative and ideally non-parametric in that it won't depend upon a set of numbers in some expansion, which may have nothing to do with reality. And it turns out you can do that. Okay, so here's that spherically symmetric metric again, again, just at the beginning uh, where we've replaced the time-time component with an arbitrary function of radius the uh, RR component with another arbitrary function of radius, and then there were an aerial coordinate, so just the standard R squared, the omega squared at the end. And, and I'm not gonna tell you what N and B are, other than we want to enforce asymptotic flatness, so everything has to behave reasonably far away. And we want there to be an event horizon, so at some place N has to go to zero. And if you give me just those two facts, we can prove the existence of a stationary circular photon orbit, and you can even work out in terms of n an algebraic relation uh, for where to find that. And given that, you can work out then what the size of the shadow should be. It's just one over the radial derivative n prime at this photon orbit. And I haven't had to specify anything more about n. And so you can think of this either as a convenient way to construct shadow sizes from uh, arbitrary n, or you can think of this as a way to rewrite shadow sizes in terms of the space-time structure at the photon. I mentioned a little uh, a few minutes ago that, that we have these multiple images, not just the, the shadow, which would be that inner boundary of the innermost image, uh, the highest order image, the infinite order image. Uh, but we do have all these rings and they're shifting and it turns out and you can see them in profile here. This is the big one, this is the small one. And you can see n equals one equals two shifting over. And as we go to higher and higher order, they asymptote to the shadow edge. And in fact, we can write down an expression that describes just how much better the next order is relative to the current order in comparison to the current relative to the last. You know, sort of a you think back to your math math courses, you know, some convergence criteria, uh, and this limits to some number that turns out to be the radial orbit Lyapunov exponent. It describes how fast radial orbits near the photon orbit diverge away. And that sounds like an interesting um, coordinate dependent quantity, right? Because this radius and general relativity is a coordinate. We don't actually have the unique statement for, for what that should be, uh, but it, it can be measured. But because it can be measured, this combination ends up being a gauge invariance statement, okay, a good measurement. And it depends upon n, the derivative, first derivative n, and the second derivative. And that kind of makes sense, because if we imagine an effective potential, which is going to depend upon exactly what n looks like, we could write that down in terms of n. The uh, peak is going to be determined where n prime is, is uh, going to zero somewhere, or where, where the fixed value of n prime. 
Uh, and the instability is going to be determined by the second derivative, how, how bold this is, right? So, you know, we're really making, in some sense, a Taylor expansion around this peak of the metric. Again, recasting everything in terms of, uh, in terms of quantities that are relevant for gravity. And so you can, instead of trying to write down some parametrized uh, uh, perturbative expression, you can write down a non-parametric uh, non-perturbative description of EHT measurements. Here's the shadow measurement or a shadow measurement uh, in principle uh, written in terms of N prime and N. So the uh, the GTT, the uh, time time uh, metric component and its, and its first derivative with radius evaluated at the photon orbit. And I, I alluded to this very briefly before, but it turns out that all these quantities, because they're related to observables, and because the photon orbit radius, which is just one over two pi, the photon orbit circumference is also measurable. I could put a uh, undergrad next to the black hole. He could shine his laser that way, move towards it or away from it, look the other way. Hopefully he's wearing eye protection. And when he sees the laser, he knows it's the right place. And then he can get his little ball of string and he can walk around it, measure the photon orbit uh, uh, circumference. Uh, so now I can make a measurement of the circumference and therefore that over two pi is the radius of the gauge invariant mm -hmm. quantity. So all of these end up being gauge invariant quantities, which is weird because they were sitting in a metric, which is manifestly a gauge dependent thing. Now we can do the same thing for this N double prime expression. And on each of these plots, there's a whole bunch of alternative theories of gravity or alternative descriptions of black holes that have, uh, you know, different curves that may or may not sit within the, uh, the boundaries prescribed by some uh, uh, fiducial uh, uh, measurement precision. But this is now a geometric basis on which to make comparisons. So I said uh, we were starting with spherical symmetry for uh, uh, intuition sake. We can, we can break that now. We can go to axisymmetric stationary metrics, so something that would include Kerr. It's not a perfectly general expression. Uh, not every axisymmetric or stationary metric looks like this. And not every axisymmetric is both stationary and looks like this. But it's convenient because it has uh, uh, four constants in motion. It's fully integrable. And so it's easy to start making statements about what images look like. And this one's really the Johansson metric from 2013. So he, he wrote down this class. It's been, since been rediscovered by, by many co-authors or other authors who have thought about other features they would like their metric to have. And it turns out all to be the same. So I think that this was really a, a fantastic realization by Tim. And, and we have just rewritten the names of some of the functions and, and maybe combined them here and there uh, to get into this form. In this form, everything I said in spherical symmetry over here on the left almost immediately translates over to the axisymmetric case for polar observers, which remember is what matters for something like M87, photon ring, now it's a shell. It's not a single, it's not on a plane, but it, it does have a single uh, radius. And that's gauge invariant again. The shadow size, gauge invariant again. And this Lyapunov exponent that tells us how fast the rings approach the shadow up to a coefficient of order unity that takes into account something about how oblate the space time is. Okay, so there's a direct mapping from one to the next. And even with this, we can see, you know, two interesting, and, and I don't fully appreciate the significance of some of them, uh, interesting facts. The first is that in this metric, the event horizon is completely determined by this N. And that is, of course, exactly the thing that shows up in the shadow. I don't know why the shadow and the horizon are so closely related. I mean, it, it kind of you wave your hands around and say black holes, but... I'd like to say something more specific, that there's a symmetry that actually connects these things. The second is that uh, in this metric, you can have a designer ergosphere. You can make the ergosphere wherever you want by adjusting a second free function f, okay? Um, I don't know what to choose other than Kirk. That's up to you, it's a personal decision. I'm not gonna get between you and your ergosphere, but it doesn't show up anywhere over here. So if we look at M87, we look down the pole, we actually don't see in the photon ring relationships that I've talked about anything that tells us about frame drag, the black hole spin pulling space time around. Now, that's interesting. 
Now, once we've started to write down a gravitational basis for, um, for describing shadow and photon ring measurements, uh, you might immediately start to think, well, can we compare things that EHT and future versions of EHT might see with that other great window on the gravitational universe in the past decade, LIGO and other gravitational wave observatories? And at first, um, my, my response would be, no, that's silly because gravitational waves are fundamentally a dynamical feature, right? That, gravitational waves are oscillations in the fabric of space-time you need to have the time parts of the Einstein equations. You're in a non-stationary environment. And if you don't have those, then you don't even have gravitational. And, and EHT is always looking at these long, long, old, long-lived, old uh, supermassive black holes that have plenty of time to settle down. They're stationary objects. They're not moving. But that's not entirely true. Here's the cartoon that Kip Thorne uh, penned oh gosh, was 40 years ago or something, in which he drew the phases of the uh, black hole binary merger. The first thing is the in spiral, that definitely depends upon the dynamics of space time. The second is the merger. That's the part that was so hard, it took people decades to get the numerical general relativity works, uh, codes working so they could solve it. And uh, they didn't see any of this. They just saw a nice couple of peaks and it moved on. Very hard work, very important they did it. I feel a little underwhelmed. Uh, and, then, and then the third part, the ring down, which feels like it's dynamical, but it really isn't because it is uh, a kind of computation of the evolution of perturbations of a massless field around a stationary black hole background. And that's all EHT is doing. We are looking at a massless field around a stationary space-time background. So these two things are actually going to be directly comparable if you, if you make some you know, weak assumptions about what kinds of perturbations you can have and how they evolve, okay? What is that massive scale? Because it's not Maxwell's equations when we're talking about gravitational waves, but it's pretty close, okay? So this, it turns out, is directly comparable. And a number of authors have pointed out that if you take the imaginary and the real frequencies. So one over the damping time divided by the oscillation frequency. You multiply it by the multifold number and take a limit as that multifold goes to infinity. You just get back our friend, the Lyapunov exponent. In other words, when we look at multiple photon rings, we're seeing the same thing that they see when they look at ring downs. Um, this has been extended to curves. It was originally in, in smart field, extend, or uh, sorry, symmetry, but then it's extended, extended generally to curve. We need to go to L of infinity because this is true from a, a geometric optics calculation, the Iconal limit, the short wavelength limits. And so immediately when I see an expression like this, um, you know, the mathematician in me says infinity is a long ways away, and the physicist in me says, yeah, but how far? Like L of 100, L of 10, the answer is L of 2, which is the lowest L you can have. So 2 is infinity. Uh, and we could just substitute this in uh, for, for the, the quadrupole. And it turns out that's pretty close. So here's uh, this quantity divided by gamma for a Schwarzschild uh, black hole. But you can do the same thing for Kerr. You get the same answer. Uh, the very first L. It's actually pretty close, at least for at least for Schwarzschild and Kerr. Maybe it's going to be different for other space times. I don't know. But we have measurements of this thanks to LIGO. We've been hard at work at that. Uh, so they have a nice paper. There's a big table. It has damping times and real frequencies, and you can just combine them in the way I mentioned before. And this band here, this is the LIGO data on this plot. So we can start comparing them one to the other. Okay. All right, so hopefully I have instilled some expectation that maybe there's you know, interesting science to be done with these photon rings. Maybe we can get past the gas for physical systematics uh, and really start doing interesting tests of Einstein with, with lensing, multiple lensing features. So how do we go measure them? Because there was a lot of order N photon ring talk there. Well, 
That's really equivalent to saying, how do we go from this image to this image? One where it's a fuzzy fire donut to one where we can actually see the ring. And the challenge that we're always facing is the diffraction limit. I know this is an astronomy audience, so I don't need to explain what the diffraction limit is. I'm just going to note it goes as the wavelength divided by the longest baseline, which is our equivalent of the telescope aperture diameter. The longest baseline, you know, we read off a plot like this called the UV plane. This is really a Fourier conjugate plane to the image plane. And what interferometers <laughs> measure is just the Fourier transform of the image. And UV measured in giga lambda is exactly the Fourier conjugate spatial frequency. Okay. And so this U max is how far out is our longest baseline. And so ways to move from fire donut to beautifully structured image, uh, uh, there's, there's three that I know of. One, we can shorten the wavelength. Just put that out of your mind. Okay, 230 is hard. 345 gigahertz might be doable. 690 gigahertz can be doable only at the highest and driest sites. The enemy is water vapor. You know, a molecule of life floating around above us, eating up all of our millimeter photons. Um, I'm not saying I want to be anywhere else. I'm just saying that on some days it's annoying. <laughs> the second thing you might do is make the Earth larger. Making the Earth larger is just expensive. <laughs> to be done. Um, the third is instead of sharpening the array, we can sharpen the question we ask and be very careful <laughs> about what kind of information we are seeking. I'm going to start in reverse order. So what do I mean by sharpening the question? Here's a wall of GRMHD simulations. Uh, and uh, there's one, you know, two components that are immediately apparent to me when I look at a, uh, as an image like this, a movie like this. Each one of these seems to be composed of a diffuse component that extends out and produces all kinds of weird structures, often, often uh, you know, random looking structures. They might be spirals, but which arm shows up when and how bright it is, that's all kind of random. Uh, but then they also all have this very clearly defined ring, which is that secondary image. In fact, it might be a bunch of those secondary images all piling up. Okay, so let's take that seriously. Let's ask the data. You're gonna be fit by an image. We know images work. And then we're gonna add a ring. And the ring is going to be constrained to be thin. I gotta stop walking backwards. Constrained to be very thin. So we're gonna try and get this thin photon ring type structure, this ring-like structure, and talk about whether it's a photon ring later. Uh, but you know, we can ask this as a handful of parameters, as a diameter, it has a flux, it has a gradient, maybe an orientation, a position, but that's it. And you compare that to the number of parameters you have to remake an image at micro arc second resolution. That's a you know huge number. So you know we can we can distill it down. We're not asking, can it look like anything else? Can it look like a cat? Is the ring distended? Does it have multiple rings? Is it a square? No, no, no. It's a circle. It has a slash. That's all the freedom you get. Does the data like that or not? And we're going to give it the image on top of it so we can put all of the randomness into the image. But because we have simplified the question we're asking, or sharpened the question that we're asking, there's some hope that the signal to noise ratio in the EHT data can help extend the short baseline, the a large scale, low frequency information, projects that out to help us know, learn. The, the simplest thing, which would be just the diameter of this ring, which should be accessible. Unless you worry that that doesn't have any hope of working, here it is applied to GRMHD simulations. Uh, I'm just showing three of them. We fit a diffuse image and the ring. Uh, and the most important thing is this blue line up here is the flux distribution, the radial flux distribution. The spike is where the ring is. And the green is the probability distribution that we recover for the diameter, or in this case, actually the radius of that ring structure. So we are able to recover that ring structure. Now you might look at these and say, well, you know, these are awfully, these are awfully close to the ring. Um, they're not very complicated looking. But we also do complicated ones, and the answer is the same. And if we ask accurately, you know, how accurately can we get that ring radius back? Um, you know, this is in some sense, you know, the, the, the recovered versus the uh, ring radius and the 
the peak ring radius, and the error bars are all what come out of these sorts of di uh, posterior distributions. Uh, they look pretty good. They look pretty good. There's other reasons, like uh, I'm especially partial for this case because it looks like there's two rings and we get two two distributions and all kinds of good reasons to think that it really works when we do it to theoretical data or simulated data. This is what happens when we do it to M87. Um, I don't want to belabor it except to say we get very good fits. What do I mean by very good fits? If I take the ring away, it does much worse. Uh, how much worse? Sufficiently worse that the extra degrees of freedom in the ring are justified at eight sigma. That's a naive counting of significance, but eight is a big number. I mean, that's particle physics territory, okay? So even if I'm wrong by a factor of two, it's still pretty good for astronomy. Um, so so there's, there's evidence that a ring is preferred in the 2017 data uh, from M87. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a photon ring. There are many things that could be. Uh, what might give you some confidence that a photon ring is not an unreasonable interpretation uh, is that it is consistent across the entire observation epoch, whereas the diffuse emission is consistent only on neighboring days, which makes sense because we do see an evolution in the brightness profile. Okay, so it's consistent. What's consistent across the what's constant across all the days is what needs to be, and what's not constant is what doesn't need to be. So, so it actually you know, feels a lot like what we were looking for. And if we line up uh, images at three millimeters with this, and this is an older image by uh, Jae Young Kim, uh, this is a much more recent image taken a year afterwards, uh, Rusa Lu and the GMVA, uh, the extensions, the limbs of M87's jet look like they, they have their footprints right where the extended emission in that image model line up. So fields, feels like a photon ring. And I uh, look forward to validating that in the future. But suppose this is not good enough for you. You don't want to sharpen the, sharpen the question. You, you just want to make a nice image. I said making the Earth bigger was expensive, but not impossible. Um, it's in fact been done multiple times. We have Halka and we have Radio Astron. I know people uh, from, from this institution participated directly in Radio Astron producing absolutely beautiful images uh, from radio astron data, which is almost as complicated looking as EHT data. And of course, uh, there's the millimetron mission. This would be a millimeter wavelength space, uh, space, space dish, uh, uh, space based uh, millimeter wavelength telescope. Um, when global tragedies get resolved, maybe this will come back up. Uh, but there are also plans to perhaps make a uh, space based uh, element for the EHT. Okay, it's, uh, it used to be called Event Horizon Explorer. I think now it's called Black Hole Explorer or BEX. I didn't capitalize the X. This is a nice, uh, I, I don't know how to make pictures like this. It's a nice picture from Joseph Farah and, and, and Michael Johnson and Kara Hareworth. Um, this is a single long baseline. And uh, I actually think that, that that might be slightly challenging, but I'll come to that in a second. The idea behind a single long baseline is that you know, we see these higher order lensed images. And one of the things that happens is, is the, the emission gets compressed, but the light gets compressed into smaller and smaller features. And we saw that in the kind of toy model where we saw the thick annulus got compressed into ever thinner rings. Um, and that's, that's this profile here. And so the idea is that uh, as you go out in baseline length, you're going up in spatial frequency. It's like a high pass filter. You only see the high, the, the smallest scale, the highest spatial frequency scale information. And at some point that's gonna be dominated by these high order lensing features, okay? Uh, so by putting out that long, long baseline out in say a geosynchronous orbit, or maybe, maybe just a little bit shy of that, uh, you can isolate one of these photon ring features. I think the problem that I have with this is uh, the tyranny of turbulence, because this lensing promotes large scale structures, the small scale structures across the board. It doesn't pick and choose. Okay, it doesn't just take the average emission and promote that. It also promotes the turbulence. And if you have a lot of turbulence, and in these systems, we think we do, um, that means that there's gonna be a lot of substructure in these rings that is gonna compete with your capacity to detect them. 
Uh, now, the answer to turbulence is to average. You can't average coherently because of the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, so you can incoherently average, and unfortunately, incoherently average in the noise dominated limit grows or improves uh, uh, very poorly. The SNR improves as the number of turbulent realizations to the one fourth, and a turbulent realization can last 10 light crossing times of the black hole, okay, or 10 m, five light crossing times. That's like 90 hours. That's a few days. So if you had a target resolution of 10, or I'm sorry, a target signal to noise uh, 10, maybe seven, you're going to average for 100 years. That might be astronomically a short time, but for an astronomer, it's a pretty long time. So I think this might be a problem. I'd love to hear how we get past this. But I have my personal, personal preference, and this is where things get ambitious. Why have one when you can have many? It's a line that keeps playing in my head from contact. Why well, build one when you can build two at twice the price, right? Well, maybe we should have space stations. Maybe we should have a space array, okay? Well, that's crazy because, uh, you know, this, this idea of, of VEX, this is like a, a SMEX mission, 100 some odd million dollars, which is not pocket change. Someone want to give me 100 million dollars? I'm, I'm not sure I would say no. Uh, but we start looking at this, you know, people start thinking about billion. I'm not sure that that's right. Okay. EHT got to where it is by leveraging uh, uh, the, the revolution, the computer revolution, the price revolution in recording media. Put very simply, hard drives got cheap enough that we could buy enough of them to put the data on. And they're not that cheap. Okay. The EHT owns lots of hard drives. Okay. But that's what made EHT possible. More hard drives meant more bandwidth, meant more sensitivity. EHD could work with existing telescopes. So that was kind of the, the model magic that made EHD happen. I think looking at arrays in space, we want to be leveraging commercial space revolution in the same way. And here's a slick uh, picture from SpaceX's website. There's only two numbers I want people to think about. One is the fairing diameter. Okay, that's how much space you get to put stuff in. And the other one is the payload height. This is nine meters wide and 18 meters tall. The millimetron is just 10 meters across. Okay, so you could do almost millimetron, but whereas millimetron has to fold up to fit in its fairing and you have to pay for all that. I mean, I, I'm not even an optical astronomer. And when JWST was unfolding, I almost had a heart attack. You know, like what if, they spent the $10 billion on that. What if, what if like half of it didn't unfold? What if they couldn't get the secondary in place? Oh my God, you know? The same question here. And the amount of engineering and cost that goes into making that happen reliably is pretty high. But you don't have to do that in Starship. You make rigid disks or rigid dishes. Maybe they're active surfaces, but you have a, a, a stiff, rigid background. And with 18 meters of height, you can put more than one for all of a sudden. You can start sending uh, arrays up directly, and you do it cheap. This is the Starship number for the cost of space, right? I mean, there's the space shuttle. It's this is logarithmic. It's ridiculous. Okay, are they going? Is it really going to be this cheap? We'll see. But it's certainly going to be cheaper than that. Uh, no spacecraft origami. The second thing is when you start building many dishes, you have economies of scale. You get uh, you know the engineering cost for one, and then you just stamp a bunch of them out. Another thing that's really interesting about this, you know, VLBI has always been an international endeavor. Um, international endeavor, um, you know, global global efforts have to be. Uh, this could be a rare example of an international space endeavor. Uh, you have a spec space design. Every everyone can supply their own dishes as long as they meet certain requirements and can interface without having to worry about pesky technology transfer laws and whatnot. Everybody can spread the money around their own aerospace industry when they happen. If this all sounds familiar, this is the Alma model. Alma has three dish types, one from each uh, partner region. Okay, so that everybody could build their own dishes. Uh, and uh, we made lots of them. Okay, just Alma in space. Uh, there's some question, how many of these would you need? And it turns out that you can answer this question uh, pretty straightforwardly uh, just by looking at the relationship between sizes in the image and sizes in the, uh, in the UV plane, in this Fourier transform plane. 
The biggest scale gives us the resolution. We already talked about that, but the biggest scale in the image gives us a resolution in the UV plane, in the baseline space. And so the question of how many you need really comes down to just doing some geometry, grade school geometry, not space-time geometry. How many little circles do I need to fill in the big circle? How many little circles do I get for a given number of stations? And the fact that I can wait as my, uh, tele as my telescopes orbit around for at least a turbulent time scale, at least nine hours. That's one GM over C cubed in M87. And the number of patches and therefore the area I cover gives me an equation that I can solve for the number of stations. There's the equation. You can just plug that in. And here's your answer. For a given resolution, I'll tell you the number of stations you need and where to put them. EHT is down here. It tells me I need two EHT stations. That doesn't sound right. But we actually only had five for M87. We had eight telescopes observing. One was at the South Pole and couldn't see M87, so that one's out. And then two were coincident with the two other stations. So they don't really count as additional stations in the sense of uh, UV coverage. So five stations versus two stations, we can, we can calibrate our guesstimate here. If we put this all in geosynchronous orbit, period of about 24 hours, you need 18 stations at 230 gigahertz. That doesn't quite get you the uh, secondary image, the n equals one photon. Right? You could put them much further out, but then you need many more stations. 300 starts to sound like a lot even to me. But in space, we can a wavelength shorter because that water vapor that's a problem on the ground isn't a problem up there. And so you can imagine a terahertz array and a terahertz array in mid-Earth orbit gets you to something that can resolve a photon ring, complete UV coverage with about 25 inches. Okay, by comparison, here's ground-based arrays, here's ALMA way up here. That's just a bit more than WEMA, a bit less than ALMA, way less than NGVLA. SKA would be an unfair thing to put on this plot. Okay, but this is actually in the ballpark of what people talk about and do. If you wanted to get down to half a micro arc second, so you can put a couple resolution elements across that photon ring, maybe you're talking about almost size arrays in space. <clears throat> okay. And once you get to this point, you start to being able to talk about seeing M87 all the way out to Z of two. You could resolve M87 to Z of two. And once you get there, the angular diameter distance turns around, you can see it to the CUV. You can see all the M87s in the universe that are bright enough. You can watch black holes grow across cosmic time. So what would they look like? What would M87 look like? All the black holes far away would look like a fuzzy fire donut, but what would M87 look like uh, with this terahertz space array of 65 dishes? Well, I've been showing it to you the whole talk. That's the resolution of about half a micro a second. And I think this could happen in my career, certainly in my lifetime, but I look at all the young faces in the audience and I challenge you to make it happen. Certainly in your career, this would be a, a defining instrument for the community. And I will stop there and take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Okay, I'm going to follow some questions from you. Uh, final question. The calculation that would uh, be to how many telescopes we need in space, did you take into account that they are actually moving around in space and do we actually need that many? Because I remember some simulation where we could just put three geosynchronous telescopes and like sample all of the Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so I, I did I did put in an, you know a statement about moving around. Right. So this is this is the area they sweep out. Okay. Uh, that's really critical. <laughs> uh, how many then becomes how long? What is what is this turbulent time scale? So I said that that was nine hours. I don't know how many hours did you say? Ah, uh, right. This was nine hours. You can make it longer. If you, if you made it longer, you get away with fewer, right? It goes as one of the square root of that time scale. Uh, something I'm not including. Uh, one of the things we have in the HD, which turns out to be really good. Um, in retrospect, but if you were designing an array, if I were designing an array, I'd be foolish enough to try to design out. And that's redundant baselines when two cross. Turns out that's really important. You know, where it, it turns out to be very useful. But 
but uh, I'm not assuming, uh, I'm assuming those don't happen and, and that's obviously not right. And you could be much more realistic about it. Uh, but I think with the nine hours, you do want to keep it pretty short because I want to make that movie. I don't want to make a smeared movie. I mean, if we're going to go put the dishes up there, we might as well. And, and I bet you the marginal cost. I mean, if we look at the Starship launch costs, I mean, launch costs are typically like half the cost of the space mission. Well, it's 1.5K per kilogram. You know, like, it's nothing. So, you know, the difference between having to worry about smearing and not worrying about smearing is launching a few more starships. Like, let's do it. But I'm happy to talk about trying to trying to make a more mature proposal. What about uh, its idea? To put in science into Totally. Yeah. And what about scattering? So yeah, I, I didn't include SAG stars exactly because of the interstellar scattering. So at 230 gigahertz, that's about 10 micro arc second blurring kernel. And you really can't, I mean, to beat that, you're falling off the edge of the Gaussian, right? So you know, you can go one sigma out maybe, but but after that, it's really starting to get very difficult. In other words, sharpening doesn't work that well. At at a terahertz, maybe you're maybe you're better. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're better. You're still not doing that with a single baseline because you always have one station on Earth. I mean, I I don't know what Vex's frequency plan is, Good. but I'd be pretty surprised if it's more than three forty five. Three forty five. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's still pretty blurred. I think it's going to, I mean, you, Vex will be very good at getting photon rings in the same way that we get them off the EHC. You, if you make some assumption, you can pull it off. But, but if you want to make an image of that assumption. Thanks, uh, well, uh, if I understood correctly, you have said that uh, photon rings uh, with geometry it's nothing to do with ergosphere and uh, uh, oh, only stuff. only for M eighty seven for M eighty seven for the polar observer. Ah, under the Peyton assumption, perfect. That's the part I was missing because the statement otherwise it could not be true. Okay, absolutely. So Peyton, I'm glad we agree. Thank you. I appreciate it. You need to Um. So this was going back to your slides about decomposing an image into uh, bringing an extended emission. Um, using some sort of method like that with whatever your preferred choice is, uh, current coverage, future coverage, future space, whatever. Uh, how much you talk about the statistical significance of getting showing the existence of a ring, maybe getting the diameter of the ring, how well do you get bring a symmetry from a, a method like this? And how well do you get the extended emission from a method like this? So the extended emission, I think we get pretty well as long as it's not too close to the ring. Uh, certainly the pattern of the extended emission looks very, very much like the patterns that we see you know, when we do the single data sets. Um, there's a hierarchy of believable parameters that you can get out in my mind that I really have to do with resolution. Uh, the, the resolution that you need to get the diameter of a ring that has a, a diameter, ex, expected diameter of 40, 45, whatever micro arc seconds is, is not that high because you, you don't need to resolve the width of the ring once you've assumed that. Once I give that to you, your instrument doesn't have to find that. And, and getting that 45, scale, that's well within the wheelhouse of the kind of coverage we have on the ground. Um, asymmetry, it's really going to be a question of, of how much. So I'd guess that your capacity to tell the asymmetry is really going to be something like, you know, not a beam, but, but not too small a fraction of a beam difference in one direction versus another. Like a quarter beam wider on this side, a quarter beam narrower on that side or something. But but we could work these out. I mean, it, it, I want to emphasize this isn't magic, right? I'm not I'm not like suddenly making the Earth bigger by making two assumptions. I, I'm just all model fitting at some level is just very cleverly averaging down the data, and we have we have chosen to do that. Um, I don't know if I'm hearing an inherent question of what you're saying, but you did say future arrays. The space array that I mentioned. 
unless people get really excited and say, hey, let's do 600 fish. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, that I mentioned, we'll get you the n equals one ring, but not the n equals two ring. But a lot of the science I mentioned really starts at n equals two. I my like guess. Make, I like to make the case that you said that two is close to infinity, but I think one is also quite close to infinity. And one, you can actually mention this being called. Oh, oh, yeah, no, no, we do, and we get that, we get that movie at the end. I mean, I mean, we'll be, we'll, we'll be doing great things. But what I was going to say was that I think, I think uh, we get n equals one just for straight up imaging with that array. So we go after n equals two with this kind of informed modeling. And and then we can do a lot of science just with that. But you're absolutely right. We get this image. I mean, there's all kinds of, there's a whole bunch of dynamic. I mean, the, the frame dragging is totally visible in this. It's just degenerate with astrophysics. Mm -hmm. And and so once you get this this picture, then then we're we're really getting deep into enough data to start the demographics. And the demographics, I think, oh, I think yes. this, this is one of the largest potential. I mean, yeah. you can move from, let me say, in Saige to all the sources, and as you said, I mean, you can get all of them, you know, at some point, I mean, you have, you, you will see all of them, absolutely all of them, and then you will understand all the lack of growth over a of time. And this is one of the biggest questions now. Absolutely. So, and, and and I didn't mention, but it's kind of, kind of funny that if you know where all your satellites are well enough to do terahertz VLBI, I guess it's connected and inter, connected element interferometry at that point because you don't have weather, but you, you do interferometry. Um, you have not a great, but an okay gravitational wave detection. Oh, and it sits right in the in in the gap between uh, between LIGO and and Lisa. So, and I see more time. Well, the answer to that question really depends on sensitivity. So I didn't I didn't say what bedevils something like this, but besides the obvious problems of uh, uh, actually getting somebody to take seriously putting up 65 dishes. Um, you know, there are real technical challenges with any of these high frequency space arrays. Um, chief among them are telemetry, getting information down from the array, and, and uh, sensitivity. And the answer to your question is really going to depend on the answer to the sensitivity question. So there's a lot of things that you could do with, uh, you know, one or half micro arc second resolution imaging capability if you could bring it to there. So I'll give you one. Uh, bearing in mind that EHT only sees things with brightness temperature bigger than 10 to the few times 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10. I mean, we're looking at hot things, okay? Anything else is not is not uh, not bright enough for us to see. But if you could drive the sensitivity of, of uh, these dishes up sufficiently, then that's enough resolution to look at uh, uh, moons forming around planets who are forming in protostellar disks or protoplanetary disk everywhere in the Milky Way. You need to get down to brightness temperatures of a few thousand. That seems like a long way. But, you know, high resolution, a lot of amazing things. I, I think the most interesting things would be making movies of, of uh, M87 Sagittarius star uh, and a bunch of other nearby black holes. I mean, you've see, seen these lists of things that are just beyond the reach. Um, and, and then doing the demographics across the Thank you. Oh, well, the so um, you talked about decomposing the image into a ring and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, the background is responsible for what happens on the ring. Um, so I think that might be reasonable to think about uh, the three-dimensional structure um, around the black hole and the putting in geometry to straight dancing directly in the sky. Yes. Yes. So so the toolkit that we use for this is called Themis. Um, and it was designed specifically to do what you just described, was to take physics-based models, physics-laden models, um, and ray trace them and compare them directly to the data. Uh, it turns out that 
that is still pretty computationally expensive, uh, even with GPU speed ups on the ray tracing. And it's really the rate of transfer, you know. I should be careful because if I say ray tracing, there'll be a few people who figure out a way to do the ray tracing faster. But that's not the problem. The ray tracing is instantaneous. It's the radiative transfer along the way. That's the problem. We're starting to develop tools to uh, speed that up. You know, build, train up meta models, machine learning models on libraries of ray traced images that then can be evaluated much faster and can allow us to explore the space. And you know, even if those have some artifacts, then you can find good places and then turn on the expensive version and see where it goes. But um, yeah, so so we've had we've had that thought, um, and some people are also working on trying to do you know, some version of tomography. Um, I think Avi Levis is doing this. Um, Daniel Palumbo has been thinking about this sort of thing. So people do have these thoughts. Um, this was this the the ring plus image was just obvious and and easy. Are there any other questions from the audience? I think we can start from there from the no, no. Okay. Uh, hold on. Anyone? Yeah, sure. Online? Are they? Yeah. No. So assuming I will build some sort of uh, base solution. Let's assume that I'm able to figure out the input one put on one of the that can be done. What would be the most uh, important question out of one of hundreds? Which I think, which, which you think would be the most helpful to us, you know, progressing to kind of gravity or astrophysics. What is the most important thing that we would learn from that? Is that what you're asking? Or is what, what would be the most important thing to do now to make it happen? Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I spent a lot of time trying to think of ways to find faults with general relativity. Um, I love GR. It's a beautiful theory. I, I, um, I feel like nature should be beautiful. Um, I know I've got the wrong answer when it looks complicated. I know I've got the right answer when it all falls out and is simple. I get that feeling with GR. Um, but part of the reason why the Perimeter Institute exists is because we know GR can't be the right theory. Or the standard model can't be the right theory. Quantum field theory can't be the right theory. You gotta choose one. And and or or none. And uh, you know, my way, you know, some people can stare at uh, stare at the model and and divine what must be happening. I am not that person. I stare at the data and look for look for signals that something else might happen. Um, there was a joke I saw on Professor uh, 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 door when I was an undergraduate who said, uh, humans trip over the truth all the time. Usually they just get back up and keep walking. So I focused very closely on the ground in front of my feet. So when I trip over something, we find it. And, and I think here, these high resolution lensing studies provide a way to validate that general relativity in increasing precision is at least applicable here. Uh, this is an obvious place to look for deviations. Uh, sometimes people say we can go look at stellar mass black holes. Um, even this space array is not going to do that, although maybe not going to do that. Um, but stellar mass black holes are still really far away from the Planck scale. And so, so I think if we have a hope of seeing observational evidence in astronomical settings with deviations with VR. Um, this is this is one of, if not the prime place to go for it. And, and so that's kind of the, you know, the most impactful thing would be for us to find something's wrong with these photons. They're not in the right place. They're not doing the right thing. Building the tools to do that credibly is I think what I've been focused on. Thanks a lot, Ernie. Uh, thank you very much.